Welcome. This is James Galliard, and this is my podcast, Orthos Straight Talk. Sometimes we're talking about personal growth, sometimes it's about pastoral ministry, and sometimes it's public policy. But whatever we're talking about, the talk is straight. I hope today's show informs you, and I hope it inspires you. Well, welcome everyone. This is James Galliard. Welcome to Orthos. And my special guest today is John Kearney. John is the, I guess the technical, the correct name will be Director of Nash County Board of Elections. And so, John, welcome. I'm glad you're joining us. Thank you. Glad to be here. Um, Just so folk have an understanding of your role and what you do, just give Mm -hmm. us an understanding of what that is. Uh, My job, I'm hired by the Board of Elections to oversee the daily operations of the Board of Elections. That may be overseeing voter registration overseeing elections, um, things like that. Just the day-to-day operations of the Board of Elections, and sometimes it's slower, and then sometimes it's like now. It's uh, the opposite of slow, but that's what my job is, to oversee the whole entire office, work with the county on funds, and work with the board, work with the state board, be sort of an intermediary and administrator of the office. Sure, got it. So, And lots of people are going to be listening to this that are not from Nash County, mm-hmm. right? And so... A lot of this information, do you think it's going to be transferable to other communities? Pretty much. Most everything is, is, is the same across North Carolina, across all 100 counties. And if you start going across state lines, then you have some differences when it comes to elections. But for the most part, uh, all the counties in North Carolina operate, for the most part, the same. Got it. So let's jump on in. I want to begin the conversation, John, with, and, and the whole point of this, of this podcast is so that we can get good answers for people, so they know factually what's going on. We can alleviate some of the nervousness and anxiety. So I want to begin with the conversation around mail-in versus absentee balloting okay. or voting, because sometimes those terms are being used interchangeably. Is there a Correct. difference? Is there a same? So talk to us about mail-in versus absentee. Okay. So the word absentee encompasses all ballots cast before Election Day. So in-person early voting at a one-stop location is an absentee ballot. The ballot that you would cast by mail is an absentee ballot. So the people do get caught up on, on the words because absentee does include both. But most people in the public think of absentee, they think the mail-in ballot. They, they think is early voting as the in-person voting but they are technically all absentee. So this year, because of COVID, um, the State Board of Elections it lack, relaxed some of the requirements and some of the standards. And so could you just review with us what is required? Let's talk specifically about that that 85-year-old or that person that's really nervous about going out and touching the polls. Can you walk us through what that process would be in terms of how they would get their ballot and then what they would do and what would be the requirement for them getting it back? Right. So... Uh, the voter or the voter's near relative uh, needs to complete an absentee request form, or they can go to the new State Board of Elections portal. Uh, the good thing about the State Board of Elections portal doesn't require any kind of printing off of a document and signing it. It's all done electronically. You sign your name with your stylus or your mouse. That's, that's really nice um, from our standpoint. The, the data still comes to us basically the same way as DMV data does. It goes straight into the State Board of Elections website and funnels down to us, and we process it just like we would a regular piece of paper that we process. So the voter or the voter's near relative completes the document or completes the online portal, portal, and we will put it in our queue in our office, and then when time comes to start mailing ballots, which is tomorrow, I just left my office, and we just got a shipment of ballots and 6,000 envelopes in, so everybody at my office is starting to stuff, preparing for tomorrow's initial mail-out. So we will package up the ballot, with instructions and everything, and we will send it to the voter. The voter gets it, the voter opens it, and casts their ballot. And then they complete the return envelope. And the return envelope requires one witness. Somebody needs to witness it, whoever, the relative or family member or something like that. It used to be two witnesses or a notary, and that was relaxed by the legislature, so that made it easier for this for this year. So they complete the, the paperwork, complete the form, put the ballot inside, seal it up, and put it back in the mail. That's one way. Put it in the mail to us. It's one stamp, just one forever stamp, basically 55 cents. So they do have to affix their own postage. Correct. They okay. have to affix their own postage. Okay. And it comes back to the postal service to us. Uh, we get it. We check it in our computer system as having received. And once we log in our system as having received, then for all intents and purposes, the person has voted. Okay. Then it goes into a lockbox and is stored until the Board of Elections starts their absentee meetings. 
And starting the fifth Tuesday prior to election, it used to be the third Tuesday, now it's the fifth Tuesday because of the volume, mm -hmm. the board will actually come in and they will go through each one of those envelopes and looking at them just to make sure they meet all the criteria. And once they meet all the criteria, we will open the envelope, pull the ballot out. It will be fed into a machine just like anybody else who feeds a ballot into a machine on election day or at early voting site. Okay. Um, if the voter doesn't feel comfortable about putting in the mail, they can drop that uh, absentee by mail ballot off in our office. The third way to get it back to us, uh, and I would not say this is the preferable way, but this is the option, is you can go to a one-stop in-person early voting site and, and turn it in there. The downside of that is, well, you're going to probably have to wait in line to get to somebody to turn it into, and sort of, you know, you've not really done anything. If, if you're scared to go inside the polling place to vote, and some people rightfully so, right. then turning your ballot in there is probably not the best thing. It should be brought to our office where there is no line, and we can take it anytime we're there during business days, business hours, or put it in the mail. So what about, let's just say I received the, 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 the ballot, I filled it out, I've mailed it back. Is there any kind of code that I will get to track it to tell me where it's at or anything like that? Yeah. For the first time, I've been, I've been asking for this for probably six years, and we finally, the state board is partnering with a company called Ballot Tracks, which has been providing a, a service using the United States Postal Service's intelligent barcode for years, tracking ballots. And we've seen a small demo of it, but it's not live yet, so I can't give you a whole bunch of details, but from what I understand, you'll go to the State Board of Elections website, and you will look your name up, your information up, just like you can look your information up now and see your sample ballot, you look your information up, and that information will be tied back to that intelligent barcode that's on that ballot. Through ballot tracks, you will be able to see where your ballot is at, leaving our office to your house and then from your house back to our office because both ways have an intelligent barcode. Got it. So if I, if I were to request a, a, a ballot, early a, a ballot, and what, what's the time frame that I should start getting concerned. Well, wait, I, I mailed something in or I faxed a request in. I still haven't gotten my ballot back. What's a reasonable time frame before I, I need to feel like I need to go ahead and revisit this? Um, well, you know, I don't know how things are going to work with the Postal Service with the number of volume, you know, volume that is out there. But uh, I would say request early, request now, mm -hmm. and then get the ballot, turn it right around the next day and get it back to us. And then, you know, give yourself seven, you got seven to ten days. You got plenty of time. Right now, you got 60 days from tomorrow till election day. Right. Okay. So if you request it now, you get the ballot in, say, four or five days or a week, then turn it around. You still got 40 some days out there. You got plenty of cushion. Now, if you wait till a week before election day and you do this, then you dens when you start getting into possibility of running out of time. And that is on our instructions. We specifically put a note on our instructions. Uh, one thing we said, if you're mailing your ballot past October 22nd, you make sure you go in there and get a postmark physically stamped on that ballot by the post office. Okay. Because there are quite a few people who don't do that. Even though the instructions tell you to get it postmarked, it's just like turning your taxes into IRS on deadline day. We need that stamp with that date because it, the ballot has to be received in our office by 5 p.m. on election day or 5 p.m. the following Friday as long as it's postmarked by election day. That's why that stamp is important. Got it, got it. So, I'm, and I don't know that you would have data on this, John, but one of the things I was surprised about a few years back, our church does a lot of active uh, donation of blood, right? Mm -hmm. And so we would have the Red Cross come, we would donate blood, and I was really surprised by the large percentage of rejections we got because of maybe, you know, whatever they tested for just wasn't quite right, mm -hmm. they didn't weigh enough, or whatever the case mm -hmm. was. It was like a really high number, like 25% or 30%. Right. Do you have any sense historically when a, when the mail-in ballots come back in, what percentage gets rejected for whatever reason? Um, no, for the most part, in general, 99.9% mm -hmm. .9 of them are fine, you know. Now, any ballot that comes in our office that has a, a, a defect or something is wrong with it so far as it's missing a signature, the voter skips something, we're going to call the voter or we're going to send them a letter. First thing I'm going to do is try to call them, say, look, there's something wrong with your ballot, you missed this, and then we're going to spoil that one and reissue issue them another one and send it back to them and tell them to do the correct ballot. 
Um, so that's before it ever gets to the board. That's what staff will do to make sure when the board members get it, we've done all that we can do to fix any problems that there, there may be. But it's by the time it gets to the board, there's very rarely ever any ballot that's not counted so far as the absentee by mail. I say 99.9% .9 of them always count. Now again, it, part of the problem lies when it when you have a, a bunch of them come in that have defects on them. They're because of these special interest groups mailing out stuff that the voters don't understand. Mm -hmm. This happened, I believe it was in the primary. It's so busy right now, I can't keep my year straight <laughs> if it was the primary or 2018, to be honest. But these groups send this stuff out and nobody ever requested an absentee ballot. or, or And people just take the form, they fill it out, and they send it in. Right. Well, then they call us, why am I getting this ballot in the mail? I, don't, I didn't want this ballot. Well, you fill the form out, request, so here we are sending it to you. Well, I don't want it. I want to vote on election day or vote whatever. Uh, well, then just don't send it back in. As long as you don't send it back in, there's no problem. So there is a miscommunication sometimes when special interest groups just send stuff out that people don't know what it is or, or, or understand what it is. Got that. And so that kind of raises another question. So, you know, I know I got it my home you know, basically a form, it was a ballot, a sample ballot request mm -hmm. form, a ballot request form. It it was a postmarked, a pre already postage paid envelope. It had Nash County Board of Elections with a P.O. box. Mm -hmm. If someone had completed that, would that have been valid or should they not, for the most part, be using these third party requests? Well, uh, that's a... Uh -huh. There's a no right answer to that thing. So the, for the most part, let's say there was a, the first batch that went out had part of the information pre-printed on the form. Mm -hmm. And the legislature has made that illegal. You can't pre-print anything on the absentee request form. It's got to all be done by the voter. Right. So that made the first ones that we were getting, and I don't remember what month it was, we were getting those probably uh, June or July. The first batch of those was wrong. And the mm -hmm. state board, as soon as they found out about it, they contacted the company and said, you got to stop. This is what North Carolina law is. You can't do this. So the company rectified it, but those had already gone out. So what we had to do was contact every one of those voters that we got and say, look. And thankfully, it was at the beginning of the process, and there wasn't that many. Uh, this is illegal. You can't, you can't, you can't do this. It's got to, the, the company that sent it to you sent it to you wrong. Let us send you another one. And we sent them another one, a blank one that they could do that was correct. Okay. Uh, but the ones that I have seen that are going out now, as long as it is on the state board of elections form, mm -hmm. they can put it in their material as long as it's not pre-printed on the Got voters' it. information. And am I correct that that ballot request um, can also be faxed in? Yes, the ballot request can be faxed or emailed in or mailed in or brought in. Okay, but the actual ballot itself can only be brought in by a the, the individual voting a near relative or mailed. You're correct. Okay. Correct. And for, for really, the request form is the same way when it comes in person. In person, it's got to be the voter or the voter's near relative for the request form, just as it is the ballot when it comes in in person. But you're right. The ballot can only come back for civilians, can only come back um, by mail or in person by the voter or near relative. So, so, John, let's just dig in a little bit on the concerns people have around any fraud that's attached to this. So let's just okay. play through a scenario. An uh, individual requests a ballot. They get mm -hmm. the ballot. They mail the ballot. They complete their ballot. They mail it back in. Okay. But then they decide on election day, I'm going to the polls. Okay. What is going to happen? So when they go into the polls, they're going to go up in this county. We have computers. So they'll go up to the desk, get their name and address as required by the statute. We'll pull the voter up. And if the, if the, even if the poll worker tries to hit the button to, to give them an ATV, an authorization to vote, it's going to say, sorry, this person has already voted. So the computer is not going to let them vote. Okay. Now, they can still vote. That would be by provisional because we have to give provisionals if, you're inten if you really want to vote. So we would send them to what we call our help desk, and they could do the provisional ballot, which is stored separately and doesn't go in the voting machine. And then... Once we finish reconciling everything, those people who did that will be submitted to Raleigh and the, the district attorney. So if, let's just say a person is just adamant, I did. I know the computer saying that I voted, mm -hmm. but I did not mm -hmm. vote. Then at that point, they don't get turned away. They can go ahead Correct. and cast a provisional ballot. Correct. And, and we do that, have that happen. I mean, anytime you put humans into the mix, you're going to have, there's always a possibility that, that somebody will choose the wrong name or something, poll work gets been sitting there 12 hours, 11 and a half hours for two and a half weeks. 
Uh, so yes, and, and that does occur rarely, but it does occur, and it mainly would occur at one stop. So if somebody came in and it's a junior or a senior or a first or a second or, you know, there are two twins living in the same house, you give the name and address, and especially twins, uh, same date of birth. Because early mm-hmm. voting, we try to do it by date of birth simply because it helps us pull them up faster and, and, and move them along faster. Uh, but they could accidentally highlight the wrong name and make a mistake. And if that occurs, then what we do after election day is we have to go through all the paperwork. So I'll go through and find that ATV that voter signed early voting. I'll go through and look at their voter registration record. And then I'll go through and look at what happened on election day and see if I can determine who actually voted at those two times. I may have to pick up the phone, make some phone calls, see what, see, figure out what is going on there. Uh, okay. And if it was the voter who voted twice, then we deal with that another way. If it wasn't, then we deal with that another way. Gotcha. But that kind of reconciliation is what happens between election day and canvas. That's why it's 10 days. Gotcha. Uh, that's so much of that goes on behind the scenes that people don't see. They think election day is over. We're done. <laughs> We're not done. We have a whole lot to do to clean it all up and get the paperwork straight. So, and, and just speak to that really quickly because I think people watching this or listening to this may not be, really be aware of that. When election night hits and – and then they're 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 indicating winners and losers. Technically, that's not done deal, right? That is correct. They're not the winners and losers. They're the unofficial, or somebody's called them the winners or losers. It is not official until the board of election meets on the Friday after the week after election and certifies those results, and then the state board certifies the state level results. So. No, things can change. I mean, it depends on how many provisionals you have or is there another problem that's got to be dealt with. So, yes, especially when you start talking close close, close races. Right. You know, now if you're a state-level race and you're 20,000, 30,000 apart, well, it's probably not going to change. But, right. you know, if you're a school board race and you're 10 votes apart, well, you know, that's possible. Right. So so one more scenario on, on the mail-in so I'm clear. Let's say you're a person like me where I went ahead because I saw the new portal – that the mm-hmm. state has. I thought that was really cool. It was mm-hmm. really slick. I was curious in case my members asked, how does this thing work? Mm-hmm. So I went ahead and I had one one concern. And my, my, my one concern before I asked the question was what you mentioned, how you sign. Mm-hmm. So I got, you know, with mine, I had to like literally, literally use my mouse, right? Yeah, I can't. <laughs> right. So, so immediately I thought to myself, that in no way looks like my signature. Correct. So is there any chance it's going to be bounced back because the person receiving it is going to be like, hey, that's not James Gellier's signature? No, in, in North Carolina, we don't do signature verifications. I'm, okay. not, I'm not certified doing signature verifications. Now, when I will look at a signature is when we have a double voting situation like we talked about a while ago. Mm-hmm. Then I, if I can, I look at the signature. Well, maybe it doesn't say John Doe. Maybe it says James Doe. <laughs> okay, well, it's supposed to be James Doe. Did James do, you know, so okay. from that standpoint, we do look at signatures, but we we do not sit here and look at how the signature is written to compare. Got it. So in my situation, I'm one of those guys that caused you all a little bit more work, probably, because I was really curious about how the process worked. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be able to communicate it effectively. So I went ahead and requested my, my ballot. Mm-hmm. But I know I'm going to vote during early voting mm-hmm. in person. So now my my ballot is out there. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have it at home somewhere, mm-hmm. but I'm going to go in early voting when I show up during early voting to vote, knowing that there's this ballot hanging out. I haven't I haven't submitted it yet, Correct. but it's hanging out. Right. What is going to happen in that scenario? Nothing. Okay. Uh, the, the computers at early voting will not even know that you have a ballot. They won't. Our office knows, but your computers won't. So they're not going to stop you from voting. Again, until that ballot comes in our office and we scan it and lock it in, then it's not received. Okay. So as long as you don't turn the ballot in, and I just, I got to say this part. I hope people don't do that too much. There is a finite number of ballots. You know, we try to have enough n- enough ballots for everybody to have one, don't run out of ballots. But, you know, if 3,000 people done that, well, then that cuts me 3,000 ballots out of my stock. So take that into consideration. But nothing would happen. you still be able to vote at early voting, and you'll be fine. Well, let me ask you this then to that point. Could I t- once I receive that ballot, could I – Go ahead and complete my ballot and then let that be the ballot I take to the early voting site? No, there's just too much uh, too much problems with that. So we're going to take it. If you bring it to the early voting site and want to cast your ballot at the early voting site, mm-hmm. like put it in the machine, then we're going to take it from you and spoil it, which means you know we write the word spoil so it can't be used. We're going to put it in a pack, and we will give you a fresh new ballot because we're it. not going to let you bring a ballot from the outside to put in that machine. Got it. 
That's all real helpful. So let me just just shift gears a little bit and talk about the early voting schedule. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about in Nash County what our locations are and what does the schedule look like for early voting. Okay. We have four locations. The main site will be over at the uh, Ag Center in Nashville uh, in the auditorium. And then we will be out at Mount Pleasant, like we've done the last few elections out there to service the Bailey Middlesex people. Mm -hmm. And then we have two sites in Rocky Mount. We're not going to be at Brazzaville Library this time. We're going to be across the road at the old Gateway Partnership building. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth site will be the old Traded building in between Buffalo Wild Wings and uh, Olive Garden. Okay. We're going to be open from 8 to 7.30, Monday through Friday. From 8 to 3 on the Saturdays, the three Saturdays, wow. and from 12 to 3 on the two Sundays. Wow. Uh, I'm, I have to, everybody needs to understand this is, this will be an election unlike anybody's done before, or we haven't done around here before. Uh, there will be social distancing involved. So when you come to a site, if you come during the heavy times, when everybody else gets off work at lunch and wants to come vote, okay. I'm only going to be letting a certain number of people in the room because mm -hmm. six feet apart, workers and voters must be six feet apart. Mm -hmm. And whenever we get to that limit, you'll have to stand outside until two people out, two people in sort of thing. So I just want voters to understand the social distancing will be in effect, and you, that may cause lines. And I, I strongly encourage people to think about voting by mail or voting early at off times. Okay. Try not to wait till election day because election day you only got one day. There's no coming back tomorrow. It's over and done with. So just yep. don't wait till election day. So regarding John, those early voting, those four early voting sites you just told us about, will each of them have a curbside option for like senior citizens oh, or yes. the disabled? That's required at all sites in the state of North Carolina. Uh, most of them are going to have two. Uh, Nashville will have two, and um, I may have a third person added, but. Uh, all the, well, I think Mount Pleasant will probably just have one because of its location. But the two in Rocky Mount will have two curbside parking spaces, and we'll have two workers dedicated to nothing but curbside. Now, you know, if more than two people come, two cars come up at a time, we'll just pull over, and as soon as we finish those, we'll walk over and take care of you. We'll take care of you, but again, if four or five cars come up at a time, we can't, you know, handle but so much at a time. So just be patient. You're going to have to be patient, and we will get to you. Right. So, and I, I actually, I do have one more question about the mail-in, the request of the, our ballot on a mail-in basis. I can go onto the site, fill out the form that you require or the state board requires. If I, if I printed that form out and was passing that actual form out, mm -hmm. a blank copy of mm -hmm. it, is that permissible to mm -hmm. do the copy and pass that out? Long as, it's, long as it's the blank form with nothing pre-printed on it, it's fine. Because I mean, it's no different than going to the website and making 10 copies when you print it off. So, no, that's Okay. Fine. So we cover early voting, mail-in ballots, absentee ballots, election day itself. Mm -hmm. Election, and, and I don't know that we, we may have said this, but so we're clear, and I may have just missed it, October 15th to October 31st. Correct. Yeah, I forgot. I didn't okay. say that. Right. that. That is the one-stop period. Okay. So that's that window. What's the last time a person can register and vote in this election? Well, then, and, and that's a confusing question. So it, are you asking? So it's two things. Are you registering to vote at early voting, or you want to register and vote on election day? Those two different animals. Okay. If you're going to vote on election day, mm -hmm. you must be registered 25 days before election day, which, if memory serves me right, is October the 9th at 5 p.m. We must have your registration form. Okay. Okay. But if you miss that date, or if you're going to vote at an early voting site, you can register and vote at the same time. Okay. You just have to have proof of residency. Okay. So you have to have some kind of paycheck, uh, government document, uh, driver license, or uh, utility bill, or credit card statement with your name and address on it okay. for uh, within, can't be any older than like three months, okay. to prove your residency. So when, I, when you register, you invoke your vote. Remember, you're voting based on that address. So mm -hmm. you have to have proof of residency. Which, which leads me to a question, actually. Let's say a person... Um, either gets married today or changes their 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 address today. Mm -hmm. What would be the cleanest way, in your opinion, for them to record that so they're still able to properly vote? Okay. It, it you really need to make all your changes before October the ninth. Okay, that, that, that's the cleanest way to do it. If you've gone to DMV and you've moved, or or if you've moved in period, or you know, and, and the problem we have in Rocky Mount and, and in uh, Sharpsburg is. People will jump in across tracks, Edgecombe County, Nash County, Nash County, Edgecombe County, Wilson County. Well, voter registration does not cross county lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you move from one county to the other, you must re-register in that county. 
Uh, so if you've moved into Nash County, you need to go ahead and do your voter registration form now, send it in so we can take care of it, and you won't have any issues. If you don't do the form, well, let me put it this way, if your information is not correct, when you show up, then we move you to the help desk. So we have the check-in and the help desk. The check-in is the people that come in and everything's correct. I want to get you in, I want to get you out, get you in, get you out. Mm -hmm. Well, those folks whose stuff is takes more time, we move you over to the side, and we'll, we'll take care of it, but you got to be moved over to the side. Okay. Now, if you come, the, the real problem is not early voting. The problem is election day. Okay. you got to remember, election day, you must go to your assigned polling place. You can't go to the one-stop sites. You go to your assigned polling place. And that is a real confusion um, right there. And uh, in some regards, I think it would be better if we didn't have one-stop sites and election day sites being the same same place. I was actually going to raise that question because if we had any of this that were the We same. do, the Ag Center. Okay. You know, I'm probably going to have three or 400 provisionals at the Ag Center just because people show up at the Ag Center and don't belong there and won't go where their ballot actually is. And what we will do is first tell you you're not supposed to be at the Ag Center, you're supposed to be at such and such a place, and then we'll ask you, will you go over there? Hmm. And the reason we ask you, will you go over there, is because that's where your ballot is. I mean, I have 22 different ballot styles. Well, the Ag Center might not have your ballot. So I, if I vote you here, even if I vote you a provisional ballot, you might not have a certain candidate on your ballot that you want to vote for. Gotcha. You know, or if you vote for a candidate you're not entitled to vote for, all those have to be hand counted because you can't vote for somebody you're not entitled to vote for. So we strongly encourage people to look up their information, know where their election day voting site is, if they're going to wait and vote on November 3rd. Okay. So four early voting sites, and then when we get to election day itself, mm -hmm. that's November 3rd, mm -hmm. Talk to us, how many voting sites in Nash County on Election Day itself? There are 24, early, 24 voting sites, the same 24 that we've had for, for years now. They'll be open from 6.30 to 7.30. Okay. And at 7.30, the chief judges will announce the polls are closed. Anybody in line is allowed to vote, wherever the line's at, but you got to be in line. If you're not in line, when they say polls are closed, that's it. And okay. the same thing at early voting. When the, poll, the, the polls open exactly at 8 o'clock, and they close exactly at 7.30. Okay. And... You know, sometimes people come up to the door, and I, I'm sorry, but I, that's what the law says. The law says it opens exactly at this time and closes exactly at this time. Everybody's treated treated the same. Okay. So, um, when when a a person from the community shows up to vote, is there any limitation? Is there any is there anything pro, prohibitions? That's the word I'm looking for. Is there any prohibition around their attire? If they wanted to wear the sign of their fraternity mm -hmm. or a candidate that they like or a hat of a candidate they like, are they permitted to do that as a citizen to vote or is that not permitted? Uh, they are permitted to do that. I mean, as long as it's not obscene, mm -hmm. uh, a, a voter, while in the process of voting, may wear campaign literature or shirts or hats supporting the candidate or a proposition of their choice mm -hmm. while they're in the process of voting. But as soon as they put that ballot in that machine, they go out because then it turns into electioneering. Gotcha. What about people that are, um, you know, they they don't read or mm -hmm. they're blind mm -hmm. or they have some disability and they have a person with them to help them? What does that process look like? Well, so when the voter comes up to the check-in table, and, and what you got to remember is we're here to serve the voters. Mm -hmm. We're not here to serve the person that may be standing beside them. So the voter is who I'm communicating with. I'm, that's who I need to communicate some way if, if it's a, the person's able to communicate with me. Mm -hmm. So um, if it's an obvious uh, mental or physical disability, you know, we're not going to ask anything about that. But what we have to ask is if, if they have a mental or physical disability and they lack assistance, we have to ask them that. They have to communicate that to us in some manner, okay? Uh, if they can't talk, it might be moving in the eyes or neck or shaking their head, but we've got to get some kind of communication. Again, we're here for the voters, the voters' rights. So if that voter communicates to us that they need assistance, then our next question to that voter is going to be, well, who would you like to assist you? And that voter can choose the person who brought them, the person can choose the poll worker, or the person can choose nobody. It's, it's all about what that voter wants. So okay. That's sort of how that process goes. And then we have the ADA compliant machine over there on the side that helps the visually and um, hearing impaired, and they're welcome to use that machine too. It's at every polling place. There's always one set up. But it's the voter's choice. Have somebody help them or use the ADA machine. Gotcha. Choice. 
based upon your experience, how many years you've been in this role, John? Twelve years. So twelve years. That's 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 fourth you know, presidential. Election. I was about to say this is the okay. So fourth presidential election, based on the number of requests you've seen on on mail in ballots, and just kind of you know you're talking to a bunch of people. Are you expecting that we're going to have a pretty heavy voter turnout? You think you guys are going to be really busy? I don't, you know, the the largest turnout I remember in Nash County was the 2008, which was my first one. I jumped right in that in August the 19th and know nothing about elections, and I jumped into this thing. Tell me, I jumped into the fire. Um, if I'm not mistaken, on that election, we had about 73% turnout. Wow. And that is the most I've ever seen. It, it, and presidentials usually, they run between 71-ish, 72, 73. So that's where, they, that's where it's going to fluctuate. So I don't expect it to do any different this time. I don't think it's going to pass 73%. Okay. I think it'll be right there. Um, now, in 2008, we had, at the 2008 election, we were knocking on 70,000 registered voters. And that has since fallen back down to a 66,000 level, which is where it stayed for years. Okay. And, and that happens because people get excited and everybody who's moved into Nash County and wants to vote. And then some people decide they don't want to vote no more. So this kind of goes back down. Um, but I, I expect this to probably hit that range, and the question is going to be the dynamics. The absentee by mail versus the early voting versus election day. Where's that turnout going to be? Okay. And I can go ahead and tell you that the best of my recollection, I have had 1,500 absentee ballots is the most I've ever had. Okay. That's what I remember. Mm-hmm. I'm sitting at 4,000 right now. Wow. And um, I, so... You know, I I had ordered 5,000 envelopes, went back and ordered 6,000 envelopes, and I may end up placing another order, just kind of see how it goes. So the absentee by mail is by no doubt going to be three times more than it's ever been. Okay. Now, the next question is, where are the rest of the people going to vote at? Mm-hmm. Are they going to come to early voting, which in a le- presidential general election, that's where your number is, is early voting. And like in a primary, it's on election day. Right. Or a general election, it's early voting. And I would expect... I voted in the Ag Center. The Ag Center, by the way, voted more people in a day than anybody else in the state of North Carolina per location. Wow. Did not even that. Wake County, not even Forsyth or Mecklenburg or any of those were able to touch our numbers. Wow. I hit 2,200 people in that auditorium in 2016 in a day. And I had two or three days very close to that, and everybody else was running about 1,700, 1,750. Wow. Now, we're probably not going to do that this time, and if we do, there are going to be lines because I have to social distance the room. Even though it's a large room, I still am going to have to limit the number of people that can be in that room. We can't have a line all inside the room where everybody's standing on top of each other. So from that standpoint, it's going to, it's going to slow the process down a little bit. And then in 2016, we voted 8,900 in Brazzle Library. We voted we had Spring Up and Mount Pleasant open that time, and we've done about a combination of 5,000 uh, over there. So... Okay. Uh, what I'm hoping, I still expect to do 18, 20,000 at the Ag Center. Everybody comes to the Ag Center, just mm-hmm. draws everybody over there. Right. But what I'm hoping is that the two sites here in Rocky Mount, I think the Traded Building will pull some of the downtown traffic. I hope they will pull some of the North Green, Inglewood traffic and bring them here versus going to Nashville. See, a lot of folks... In the Sunset, Winston Avenue, they all drive down to uh, Nashville, which right. makes it right. m- more volume over there and a little. But I'm hoping to move some of them over here, or they'll come over here to okay. relieve some of the pressure in Nashville. But um, I don't know. I, I, my suggestion would be is don't wait till Election Day. Right. Don't wait till Election Day. If you wait till Election Day, you know, uh, you're probably going to be standing in a line. I'm not going to tell you you're not going to stand in a line at early voting because, again, if everybody shows up at one time, I can't do anything about that. You, we'll get to you as fast as we can get to you. Right. But on Election Day, some of these polling places are small. Right. And some of them probably won't be voting five or six people at a time in there because the rooms are small. I can't change that. So they will have to stand outside until people come in. Some, sure. Some people can go through the ballot in two or three minutes. Right. Some people sit there and take 10, 15 minutes. Right. So who's in front of you is going to determine how sure. long your line is. Right. And uh, patience, patience, patience. You're going to have to have patience in this election. That's a good word. And so for the people who may have just tuned in, just give us again early voting starts when, ends when, and then what are the hours again? Early voting begins October to Thursday, October the 15th, and ends uh, Saturday, October the 31st, Halloween. And it runs Monday through Friday from 8 to 730 
and on Saturdays 8 to 3, and Sundays 12 to 3, and that is the Nash County Hour. So please don't get confused. depends okay. on where you're at. Make sure you check your local Board of Elections office because uh, those hours will vary, especially the weekend hours. That's a great word. This is a Nash County conversation for the most part. And then Election Day, um, Tuesday, November 3rd, the hours are? 6.30 to 7.30. 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. John, you guys did a, and we'll conclude on this, and I really appreciate everything you're sharing with us. You guys did a website. Yep. So tell us about the website. What's the website address so that we can direct people to that website? Well, you know, our main website is on the county, the county's website platform, and it has a lot of information up there, but it's a lot, a lot of information. You know, and some people don't want that much information. They want to know, where do I go? What do I do? Mm-hmm. And so... I wanted to build a website that I was going to be sort of a one-stop shop just for this election. You go to the home page, where do I register at? There's a button. Where do I get absentee? There's a button. Where's my one-stop sites? There's a button. It's going to tell you the answer to it. And um, so I, had, I reached out to a person and had them build it for me, and uh, I'm well pleased with it. I think it does the job job very well. And it's the address is nashvotes, with an S, 2020.com. NashVotes2020.com. Mm-hmm. We'll be sharing that. Is there anything you think I, we didn't talk about that you will want voters in Nash County to keep in mind? Oh, I think we've covered it all, and uh, I just need to stress a few points again. Try to think about voting by mail. Okay, if you're not comfortable with the post office and things you've heard, drop it off at our office. You have 60 days from tomorrow. They're going to start going out tomorrow. That's 60 days. So there's plenty of time to get the ballot in the mail and bring it back to us. Now, it has to go out in the mail, but you can return it in person if that you feel more comfortable about that. Um, second thing is, if you don't want to do that, vote early. Try not to come at high demand times. Try to come 9 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, or 7 o'clock. I can tell you from previous experience, most days, not the first three, day, not the first three days, not the last three days, the middle two weeks, if you'll come between 6.30 and 7.30, you'll walk right in and walk right out. Because hmm. about 5.30 is when it just kind of dies right down. So okay. just try not to come at peak times, and please try not to wait till Election Day because you don't know if it's going to be in North Carolina. We could have rain, we could have snow, and you might be standing outside in that, and it's just one day. Early voting in, by mail gives you so much more time to do it so please right. just don't wait john one more thing is there a mass requirement there is a ma- well there is a mass requirement for workers okay we cannot require voters to wear a mask what will happen in, and i'm glad you brought it up because I, th- I do think that people need to understand what they're going to see because the election is going to look different and again when i say the word patience you need to have patience because there will be six foot social distancing mm-hmm. okay and the way i'm looking at it i sat down with all my chief judges a couple of weeks ago individually one-on-one and we talked about every polling place in nash county and how to arrange it what we're going to do if you're in a fire department can we move into the bays you know things like that and then how are we going to set our tables up you know we're going to set our table if you got an eight foot table that's one worker at eight foot table and then we're going to put another table in front of them to give them a barrier between the voter and the worker because while I'm here to help every voter vote, one of my first priorities is going to be the safety of my poll workers. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got to take care of the poll workers. There will sure. be nobody there to help. Um, and then we're going to put in as many booths or tables as we can. Now, tables, a lot of, you, a lot of the people listening may vote at tables because a lot of people come in and want to sit down and, and take time cast about. Sure. Well, tables are going to be a little different. We're going to have tables, but they ain't going to be with two people at a table, one on each end. Right. Now, if a husband and wife come in, they want to slide the chair down and vote together, that's fine. But as soon as they leave, the chair is going back. Right. So that's, again, going to limit the number of people that we can have in the room at the same time. So when you come inside the voting enclosure, you're going to be met by a greeter. And that greeter is going to uh, control the flow of the room, the number of people in, the number of people out. That greeter is going to issue everybody in North Carolina their own ink pen. So you're going to get a free ink pen this time, everybody. We want you to take the ink pen home with you. But if you don't want to, you can drop it in one of our little boxes on the way out. Uh, there will be no ink pens on the tables or booths this time. You will have your own ink pen to carry you through the whole process. Okay. If you don't have a mask on, we will ask you, would you like a mask? Okay. We cannot make a voter wear a mask, but we will ask them if they want one. Okay. We will have hand sanitizer at the entrance and the exit. We were trying to have most of our polling places have an entrance and an exit being separate doors, but that doesn't always work in some places. Sharpsburg, for example, over there, that's just one door and it's small. There's no other way out of the room, so you're going to have to 
sort of bypass each other when you, when you go in and out. Can't can't do anything about that. Um, the poll the the poll workers will be wearing masks. Every worker will be wearing a mask inside. They have the option to wear face shields. We'll have face shields for them. At this point in time, the face shields are not required. That's for their benefit if they want sure. to use them. We'll have gloves, and that's more optional for the poll workers again, too. Some some workers might be mandated to wear gloves, and a lot of this is still fluid. A lot of things can change between now and now when we start going. But fl- gloves will be available for the poll workers, but you really can't type on a laptop all day using a pair of gloves. Sure. Um, at our early voting sites, we'll probably have what they call a sneeze guard shield up in front of the workers. I don't know that we're going to do that on Election Day just because of the logistics and the number of places that everything has got to go to. Hmm. What you got to remember from my standpoint is you can sit there and say all this stuff, but it got to get done somehow. You, you got to move that stuff there. you got to buy the stuff. you got to get it set out. you got to train the poll workers. What are you going to do when it's done? You don't have no more storage. So all those logistical things have got to be put in place to figure out exactly what's going to happen. And, you know, uh, some of it will be, you know, trial and error, see how it would go through it, because nobody around here has done this before. You know, there were a few counties up, a few counties up in the mountains that had mm-hmm. the second primary that had a little bit of this, but not on this scale. Right. Um, so that, that's pretty much what it's going to look like at early voting and Election Day if you come. Great. Well, that's very helpful. Again, my guest has been John Kearney with the Nash County Board of Elections. And in closing, let me just share this with everyone. And I'm just reiterating some of what John has said, but I want to make sure I put this one other word in. I think, number one, you know, as just the pastor of me, it's just folk be he's already said be patient. So let's be patient. Let's be prayerful. But I also want to encourage everyone to have a voting plan. Figure out for you whatever that plan is. If it's going to mail it in, if that's your plan, if it's going to be the early vote, if that's your plan, or if it's going to be a vote on Election Day, if that's your plan. But have an actual voting plan, um, and by all means, let's get the vote out. So, again, uh, get the vote out. John, thank you for being with us. I hope this information is helpful. We're going to post the websites and all of the dates um, as a part of this broadcast. Thanks so much for listening and or watching. Well, thanks for listening to Orthos. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you've got comments or questions or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Go ahead and email me, james at jamesgalliard.com. Also, invite some friends to subscribe and follow me on social media. You can reach me on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, or on Instagram. I'll see you next week on Orthos.